welcome everyone to the Deep Transformation Podcast. And um, well, I'm still John Dupuy. And if this is the first time you've listened to us, God bless. Thank you for showing up. And uh, I have my co-host and my dear friend, Roger Walsh, uh, who is um, my partner in this, this venture to try to go deep and bring back treasures for all of us. And it's certainly been working for me thus far. And the other gentleman that we have here is Robert Augustus Masters. And let me say a little bit about you, um, Robert, from first from a personal uh, place. I have been a, um, a reader of your books, and not all of them, but um, your spiritual bypassing, extremely important for me. And uh, uh, you work on on shadow and to be a man is a book that I've I've really loved and given away a number of times. So I always have new editions coming because I have to reorder it. And um, we've also worked together before on a podcast, um, um, Integral Recovery, and we had a had a really really good time and. Uh, very enlightening and and all the stuff that you've covered and you bring forth uh has been um so useful to me and sometimes it's like stuff i already kind of knew and figured out but you really deepen it and clarify it and it's like okay i'm not schizophrenic here's another here's an authority that that's that's been here before me and and i use it a lot a lot of your teachings and working with my uh my students and my house here in in southern utah was a um we filled it full of drug addicts for about eight years and worked with them and we became a family working on our stuff and your guidance and your wisdom that came from your books was um uh very powerful and and, and meant a lot to me and my students and you if you want me to read i can read you the thing from uh from the back of your book to be a man just to uh, give people a more kind of conventional bio of, of who you are. And Robert Augustus Masters, PhD, is a relationship expert, a psycho-spiritual teacher and guide with a doctorate in psychology. He's the co-founder with his wife, Diane, of the Masters Center for Transformation, a school featuring relationally rooted psycho-spiritual work devoted to deep healing and fully embodied awakening. He is the author of 14 books, including Transformation Through Intimacy, Spiritual Bypassing, and Emotional Intimacy. He's uniquely, his uniquely integral work developed over the past 37 years intuitively blends the psychological, the physical, with spiritual, emphasizing full-blooded, full-blooded embodiment, authenticity, emotional openness, and literacy, deep shadow work, and the development, development of relational maturity. At essence, his work is about cultivating intimacy with all that we are, high, low, dark, light, broken, and whole, in the service of the deepest possible healing, awakening, and integration. His work, he works side by side in very close conjunction with Diane. His website is robertmasters.com. There we have the intro. So mm -hmm. welcome, welcome, my friend. It's good to see Thank you. you. Thank you. And gosh, there's so many, uh, so many areas that that we can can go in. But one thing, uh, Roger, you mentioned you'd read a book uh, by Robert that that anyway talked about a DMT experience and a very dark um, coming out of that. And I just recently found out about that. In fact, uh, one of the times when I was I was writing. Um, uh, a blurb or something for one of your books or, or, or something about you, very positive. I, I got emails from people saying, oh, he'd been a cult leader and done all these bad things. And, and I was really? And that is interesting to me because I was in a cult for many, many years. And, and while I was at, at times I had positions of responsibility, I was not the leader. So I looked it up um, this morning before this, just as kind of an afterthought. And I saw you talking about that experience and I was so moved, you know, because it was such an honest confession of what had happened. And, 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 and you're a very powerful, beautiful, charismatic, deep guy. And I can see how I've seen those things happen a lot in our integral world. We've had, we've had, you know, people emerge that have, that have done these things and 
I'd never heard anybody uh, talk about it the way that you did in that experience coming out of that that uh, DMT experience, very broken, very shattered. And, and I've had those experiences too, using uh, um, mushrooms and other plants, not, yeah. not lately, but I can relate to that. But how you rebuilt your life and how you, you've you come out the other end of that. Mm -hmm. And from whatever, you know, all I can see from what you've done and what <clears throat> you know, uh, I'll quote Jesus is where brother, wherefore by the fruits you shall know them. And the fruits that you've been giving to me over the last, I don't know, 20 years now has been beautiful and helpful. So uh, could we talk about that for a while? I just think it's yeah. really compelling. Yeah. Major turning point in my life, probably. Huge, huge. I was on a runaway train. I was busy being special. I was arrogant, too much power. The whole thing. A lot of good stuff in there, too, but it was mixed up with a lot of bullshit, a lot sure. of crappy stuff. And when I had that experience with the it was five methoxy DMT, not just it's stronger than DMT. I, I took it with a lot of arrogance. The first puff I took some people in my community at that point, my students said, you should try this. You can do it. And an hour later, you can be back at work. It took me nine months to recover. And I almost didn't recover. And my first puff, I said, give me more. I didn't I was supposed to knock me unconscious. I didn't care. I did many psychedelic journeys before that. I, I handled them all well, I thought. I was kind of a superman to myself, legend of my own mind, all of that. Second puff I took, and I saw the two people with me, I saw them in an aperture like this circle. It was getting smaller and smaller. Ten seconds later, I was completely unconscious of them, external reality, and I was in a bizarrely altered state. Not even alter, it's almost like reality had dissolved. And I knew I was dying physically. I could tell. And I could not escape. It's like a, a lucid dream, but there's no escape. There's nothing I could do to wake myself up from it because I was already awake in another place. When I eventually came to 20 minutes later, I was told I know I almost died twice. I'd stop breathing uh, for two or three minutes at a time, turn purple. One guy was training CPR. He was pounding my chest. My partner at the time was screaming my name. I was aware of none of that. I just knew I was dying physically, and I didn't feel like it was my time. But I, what could I do? I just, I was pure witness, but I was also in a state of extreme terror and expansion. And I, and I was having seizures too. Apparently, I found out later. So I came out of that. I didn't believe what I was told that I had almost died. And the next day I got up, to go for a run at the beach. I was in uh, San Luis Obispo area. And I started to feel incredibly disoriented. I looked at my legs. They weren't, didn't even look human. I was hearing voices in a way that was extremely fast and scary. I got back and I knew I was in serious trouble. And I didn't sleep for a week. And, uh, had a well-known psychiatrist I knew fly up to, to check me. I said, oh, you had a shamanic breakthrough. You're doing great. I'll just give you some, maybe give you some Audubon. He didn't get where I was at. I finally had to go to a hospital. I, I almost faked my own sanity so I wouldn't have to be institutionalized. And I spent the next six to nine months in this profoundly disoriented state. I knew I was insane. I wasn't fully insane because I knew I was insane. And... The community that surrounded me, I, I couldn't run it anymore. I felt like a different person, like I died. And here I was with this previous incarnation demanding that I step into his shoes. Again, I couldn't do it. So I dissolved the community um, that summer and began an extremely humbling journey toward who I really am. And that was, that was extremely difficult. I would wake up most afternoons from a nap and I would feel like I'd actually died. And I was, I was just having a, this was a massive hallucination. So I was, I was, I was insane in many ways. No one diagnosed me as having shock. It was a huge shock to my system. And I had a friend later on, I met who's an expert in this area. He said, you're, you're, I see shock in your eyes. And I started to work with it more. It was a long process. And very, very humbling. I suddenly no longer craved the limelight. I craved anonymity. And the teachers I'd had before that who were kind of arrogant, like Adi Da, Rajneesh, 
I couldn't be with him anymore. I reconnected with Stephen Levine, wrote Ram Dass. I knew Ram Dass. He said, I've heard of bad trips. Yours is the worst I've ever heard. No big consolation to me, but I, I was grateful to be alive. I was grateful. I'd almost died. And that shifted everything for me. And when later on, I had a, I, I've had a death experiences since then, including a major heart attack, had prostate cancer, diagnosed 2008. I've had a lot come my way, but I kind of felt like these are bonus. This is bonus time. I get to be here. I get to evolve. I get to outgrow what drove me into being a, a community slash cult leader. I, get, I got to outgrow that, which I was so grateful for. So that's it in a nutshell. I mean, there was a, mm -hmm. a lot to be said around the process. One thing I want to add is I had to sit in extreme terror um, every night for month after month. I'd sit there pouring sweat, pure terror, no escape. I knew suicide was no solution. I would still be in the same place. I could feel that. So awesome. all I could do was just eventually, eventually, I, I developed compassion for the terrified me without any dissociation at all. I was just simply sitting there in this state. And the terror didn't go away because I was aware of it and was, had compassion for the me who was terrified. But it ceased to be so problematic. And without willing it, so I became extremely skilled at working with deep fear states, which I've been doing ever since with many people. Yeah. And, uh, Robert, I, I read your book, uh, I think, shortly after you wrote it in 2008 I, or 2005, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and yes, I've, you know, in my role as a professor of psychiatry who's done some research on psychedelics, I've you know, certainly heard of my share of bad experiences, but that was certainly on a par with anything I'd heard in terms of both. Well, I need, no, I need to qualify that because there are some people who, uh, who just should not be using psychedelics and end up in chronic uh, psychiatric conditions and mm -hmm. sometimes yeah. on locked wards for a long time. So it wasn't the worst I'd heard, but it was certainly one of the most horrifying and certainly one of the most painful by someone who who had done a lot of inner work on themselves, and I want to. I'd like to step back and put this in a context because I I really appreciate your sharing the extraordinary challenges you had with five methoxy DMT because it is now becoming um, it's now being hyped as a as a valuable drug and and. and uh, step back again, there seems to be an evolution with the discovery of uh, psychoactive active drug, drugs. First, there's someone who discovers it, possibly synthesizes a new chemical. And then uh, often the, it's kept kind of quiet by a small group of really dedicated psychonauts, inner explorers, mm -hmm. who realize the value of this potential value of the substance, but are also very wary of its both misuse and it's uh, the media hysteria and the D drug enforcement agency uh, scheduling or legalization that's almost always happens. Mm -hmm. So they try to maintain it as, as a psychoactive tool, a thera possibly mm -hmm. therapeutic tool within a small, uh, I don't know what to call it, cohort or esoteric group. But then sooner or later, it gets out. Word gets out. Popularization occurs. Mm -hmm. Commercialization, even. People may, wanting to make money off it. There's yeah. misuse, irresponsible use. The media gets hold of the story. There's a media madness and hysteria about it. And then there's the recognition of the problems. That, oh, wait a minute. This isn't the panacea that it was touted as originally. Mm -hmm. Some people get into real problems. Some people shouldn't be using it. Um, and the casualties are often overblown by the media. And then it's scheduled and made illegal. And, and in some cases, very valuable psychological, psychiatric tools, both therapeutic and uh, research, are thereby lost uh, for decades, perhaps. So there's, so there's a, there are real lessons to be learned here. And it's rare to have someone like yourself who's done a lot of psychological, spiritual work on themselves who can put this in a context and describe in, in real detail what you went through. And I think this is really important at this time, whereas the, where there's beginning to be this, ex, 
extraordinary hype around this that this is I mean, we're hearing almost this is, you know, this is a, once again, a kind of panacea, this can do that and mm -hmm. heal this. And it's like, yes, in some cases, for some people under the right conditions at the right times, et cetera, et cetera. But um, it's, yeah. it, it, it's just a, it's these things are so tricky. They're so powerful. They're so, some of them are so potentially valuable, and some of them are really dangerous when misused. Mm -hmm. and yeah. I appreciate. So I've I seen, wanted to I've put that people, in that context. Yeah, I've seen people. Other people have done five meo, and they seem fine. But I also know people that have distributed it, and I've had some of them come to me for for therapeutic help because they were so messed up by it. They didn't have the grounding. The personalization was running rampant. They lost their voices sometimes and and they were told in so many words it must be something you're not it's your fault you're not having a more positive experience which i heard too people said why was it so negative for me because i almost died I had seizures shock everything other people saying this it's the god molecule it's incredible i've had people who are had horrendous experiences just from smoking weed they were in, they had years of, of disorientation that was horrible for them other people have injected 5-methoxy during an ayahuasca journey and seemed fine, but they were probably dissociated in a way that wasn't cha challenging to them. So I agree with you in many ways. It's a crapshoot. Like, I don't recommend psychedelics to people that work with me. I often tell them the story of how when I was younger and I did peyote mushroom acid. When I stopped, I could be in a lucid dream and I could deliberately take the same drug in the dream and have a very similar experience. I'm just dreaming. And the suggestion of it, my brain took it literally, and I would have a full-blown experience. And I've also done a lot of deep meditation. I've done a lot of cathartic edge work, trauma work. And in the midst of that, often there are openings that are very psychedelic, but the person having them usually ends up feeling very grounded rather than spaced out or lost in it. So it was very sobering for me, incredibly sobering, because before that, I thought I could handle anything. And this was so, so beautifully humbling. Mm. And that's one of the distinctive things. You turned it painful and, and overwhelming as it was. You eventually turned it into a teaching for yourself. Yes. Uh, so, so there's a question here because some people don't manage that. I mean, I, I've worked on locked psychiatric units where we've treated, had a number of people who've, who have arrived in psychotic breaks from uh, misuse of psychedelics. And of course, unfortunately, from even more widespread misuse of things like amphetamine or cocaine, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But, yeah. So, so, so I'm wanting to do several things here. One is just present a balanced perspective here that, you know, these things can be, some of these psychedelics can be extremely valuable for the right person with the right sport at the right time, et cetera, et cetera. And they can be very, very challenging. But you turned it into a lesson. What, how did you do that? In part by embracing my ordinariness. Mm -hmm. I was busy being someone special or extraordinary before. I had a very thick spiritual resume. Afterwards, I didn't need to resume at all, threw it out, trashed it, and I enjoyed just being ordinary. I had to start work again. I started working just as a, a psychotherapist in a small town south of Vancouver. Didn't do groups for five years, groups were my forte. I stayed in, in low in the limelight. I didn't publish anything. I stayed very, very quiet. And I went back to school. I went to Saybrook and I was admitted as a doctoral student in the psychology program. And I enjoyed being a student again. And I found my compassion incredibly enlarged towards people. Before I'd been selectively compassionate when I worked with people. But afterwards, I felt a sense of my heart bursting open and being very compassionate, still having good boundaries, but very compassionate towards almost everyone, feeling that. Like, may I be compassionate? May I be loving? And that became a, a profound prayer for me, along with gratitude. And it was like a new life. I got a fresh start. And I, yeah, but, I, I could have missed that. I could have just gone down the tubes, died in that. I, I imagine what type of death I would have had. I've grown so much since that time. John, you were going to say. Yeah. For, I mean, from my perspective, you know, and I've, I've done psych and not for many years, but I had as at least as many journeys into hell as I did 
into the light. You know, it was pretty balanced and, uh, you know, yeah. uh, very powerful and nothing, nothing you would do for fun. But w- what I'm seeing with you, with, the, with this powerful, horrific experience and timing, it literally saved your soul. Yeah. You know, it's like God knows the world doesn't need another arrogant cult leader, you know, who thinks he's God and putting it out on everybody. Been there, seen that. It's a bummer. And the fact that you came through all of that, and maybe it took all of that. But when I was reading your 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 thing earlier today, which I hadn't got into before, I was I was deeply moved and deeply grateful. And yeah, I don't feel that I know it all. I'm God, wink, wink, wink. Uh, you know, listen to me, energy at all. I feel, you know, I'm a man who's been through the fires and been broken and has been put back together as as a real human being that has medicine to give and does it very lovingly and very humbly. It's amazing. Yeah, it was a gift. In the yeah. roughest possible wrapping, fierce grace with <laughs> capital, all capital letters. And I didn't realize that at the time, but right afterwards, when I was making my way back into somehow making a living, I felt grateful wherever I was. I could be in a tiny basement suite, whereas I've been the community leader. I had this beautiful home on a Gulf Island in Canada. I had so much privilege. It was all taken away, but not something wasn't taken away. Something was deepened in me. I wouldn't recommend that path for anyone necessarily, but <laughs> I needed to get my ass kicked royally. I really did. And, mm. uh, and, and Robert, there was, as, I rec- as I recall in reading your book, you consulted with a number of people and you really f- didn't feel helped by I a number. Of- no, mm. I remember talking to Stan Groff and he, uh, he told me he couldn't close his eyes for uh, a week after taking 5 methoxy. It was just pure horror for him. And he said, best thing you can do is have a bunch of men make a circle around you, hold you down, and you try and get up. I said, I've done that type of thing in my therapy work for many years as cathartic practice. I don't need that. I'm losing my sanity. He couldn't help. The psychiatrist I saw wasn't able to help. He was impressed by me, even though I was messed up. He be, ended up having sessions with some of my students. But I did get out of on from him, which allowed me to sleep. You're I'm sorry, you did, I couldn't hear that. I, I took out of on so I could uh-huh. sleep with Razapam. Uh-huh. But I found after I put, I still had this old hubris a little bit, in that I would only take the minimal amount of it so I could function. Finally, I met a psychiatrist in California who, who understood me more. He says, You need to addict yourself to it, take it three times a day, get stable again. Once you're stable, then you can wean yourself off it. So I did that. I was, I was, took it for two months. Then I weaned myself. And it was, most, it was even more difficult than the original experience in some ways. Weaning myself from this, I took, it took about three weeks to do it, four weeks to do it. I haven't had it since. Mm-hmm. But I, I suffered. I, was, I lost a lot of weight. I was, I was messed up. But I, I still felt I'm okay in the midst of all this. I'm okay with not being okay. So it sounds as though acceptance and compassion for yourself were really key here. And adopting a non-problematic orientation toward fear mm. under all conditions at all times, no matter how scared I was to look upon it. I, my image at the time was looking upon it as a broken, frightened little boy. And, mm. and I would still feel it in my system, but I felt such care for this boy and I was like that as a child. I had an abusive childhood. Holding him close, as part one, loving him. Part two is protecting him in a really healthy way. And that, that helped me. That when I reframed fear that way, it stopped running the show. And I felt more tapped into all my emotions. It was a whole, whole new start for me. It was quite astonishing. That, that's no small lesson. I mean, that's a... That's one of the universal challenges for all of us. So fear, mm-hmm. fear of fear is really such a prime uh, mm-hmm. reactor that yeah. just sets us going into vicious, painful, in some cases, quite destructive, you know, destructive it cycles. Did, what it also did for me, Roger, was that it, it, it brought me into extreme proximity to my mortality. Mm. I'd paid lip service to it before. 
in my meditative practice and the young guy, but I didn't really take, let it get into my bones. Now it was, it was in my face. I could feel death everywhere. And I began a practice of attuning to my mortality, which I've done ever since. I still do that. I don't find it morbid at all. I actually enjoy it. And when you say tuning to your mortality, what exactly does that mean? Feeling it, feeling it, recognizing that I'm going to die and I don't know when I'm going to die and not as an idea, but I feel it in my bones, my marrow, that I'm going to die. Mm. And I have to um, bracket something in here. In 2016, um, in the summer, I had a massive heart attack out of the blue. I seemed very healthy, eating well, meditating, very fit. I was with my wife. I was in our driveway, and I, I knew I had about, about two or three minutes left to live. That was my sense. I just this agonizing pain, which I can't describe, it was so intense. And she managed to shove some baby ass from my mouth, and she called 911. And we lived really close to the fire station. So the ambulance was there within five minutes. And an hour later, I'd already had a stent put in my, my blocked artery, and I was in bliss. I was in agonizing pain, but I was in bliss in the hospital. And that really shook me up because there was nothing I could do to um, get out of the heart attack. I was having, I could no meditation technique, <clears throat> nothing I could do. Crying didn't matter. I was almost blacking out the whole time. That was kind of was like a bookend for the five month oxy experience because afterwards I felt even more, this is bonus time. I get to be with her who's prof profoundly close. I get to do my work. I write more books. I'm here. I'm here. I'm still here. That was the phrase. I'm, st I'm still here, you know, <laughs> still here and alive. And what a fucking miracle that I had, had this great cardiac unit near me in a town 20 minutes away. And I was, I was a goner. It wasn't like when I've taken risks in deep water and almost drowned a number of times. This was just like, this was it. The doctor said, this is the big one. This is the widow maker. You had just a few minutes to go. You were right. And that brought me even closer to, to death, to where death no longer was a problem. Death was part of life. Death leaves no one out. And um, I feel very intimate with, with, with death. I bring it into all my work mm -hmm. now with clients, groups, my trained therapists. I bring, mate, let's consider this. And I'm lucky to have a partner who has the same feeling towards as I do. We know that one of us is going to die first and we're, we have no options of self-protection from that. So I'd rather be nakedly vulnerable, be devastated by her death if she goes first and vice versa. That comes out of all this. Mm. And that informs everything I do now, everything I do. Yeah, Robert, I had a very, very similar experience. I was uh, meditating and, you know, teaching about it and being in shape. I was coming out of a gym and massive heart attack. And, uh, you know, I never had a heart attack, but I knew this was a heart attack. So the first thing I thought is my dog is in the hospital, is in the hotel room. We're in oh. Grand Junction, Colorado. So like an idiot, I drive 3.8 miles, having a massive heart attack. And I guess God wow. looks after fools, you know, but I had to make sure my dog wouldn't just be abandoned there. And so I got to the hotel room and I'd made friends with the manager and she loved dogs. And so the, she was treated like royalty when they knew what was happening to me. But I got, I collapsed on the bed and, you know, Spirit kept me alive, and they came in there in Grand Junction. They have a Catholic hospital. Thank you, guys. Uh, St. Mary's, I believe, they have a great cardiac unit. They did a splint, and you know, oh, okay, I'm going to live. I, I was pretty sure I was going to die, and um, it was like, okay, God, this is it. This is it. You know, I wasn't. I was just like, okay, all right, if it's my time, you know, thanks for everything, and here we go, and um, um, it it. It definitely gave me, uh, for the first five hours after the stint, I had a very open, kind of enlightened, working through emotional stuff, spiritual, intellectual, it was all flowing. Yeah, yeah. And about five hours later, it was like a mule had kicked me in the chest. And that's when uh, <laughs> you know, the fun started. Yeah. So I, I, I can deeply relate to, to that experience. And it's had, uh, uh, it's had everything, it's before and after, everything changed after that experience, the relationship with death. Uh, what you were saying about everything's borrowed time, you know, I mean, this is extra that I'm getting now. And, um, and the other stuff this morning, I want to, I want to make this a little bit personal. I was, before I, I do these things, I meditate and pray for, you know, two hours, two and a half hours, something like that. 
And I've been reading over your book again, uh, Be a Man, and how you talk about turn into the pain. Okay, mm-hmm. that's one of the beautiful teachings that that uh, uh, I always taught my students and I, and I practice myself. And so I was feeling incredibly sad. And I said, what is it? And I just, instead of trying to feel better, oh, I have a podcast coming up. Let me think some happy thoughts. So I'm not... You know, I'm not a basket case when, the, when you know, the camera starts rolling. Um, I just the different things. I'd lost my brother to suicide. I'd lost both my beloved parents. Um, uh, relationships of people I'd been in love with that broke up in a, in a not good way. All the griefs of my life were right there. And I just, OK, here it is. Uh God, you said through Robert to turn into the be with this. And, and of course, I know that, but I was using just what I'd read in your book to help me through that. And um, when I was reading your thing before this, uh, when you're talking about the cult experience and had you been, uh, I just broke my heart wide open. I just felt such love for you and such gratitude that, that um, you were able to turn that around and become the man you are. And I've never seen it happen before. You know, one of the three teachings for me then that's, that's sort of a cornerstone of my work emerged, which is if, if there's pain, turn toward it under all conditions at all times, no matter how ugly it is, dark, turn toward it, get intimate with it, get to know it. The other thing you said that I didn't mention earlier, I had a lot of grief during that, those, those uh, nine months, nine months after the five month oxygen. So I cried, sobbed very hard really hard every day my heart was broken it got broken open but broken smashed pulverized and i felt my grief my whole life all the things that were fucked up in my life all of them and i started to feel our grief in terms of other people i knew then then it shifted all of a sudden to the grief again and again and again the grief of the entire human race and I still feel that. I mean, I know if people grieve together, there'd be a lot less problems, but there's such an aversion to, we live in a grief phobic culture where we tend to keep it frozen, trying to be strong by keeping it shut down. I mean, if I hadn't been able to cry during those nine months, I would have, I don't know if I would have made it. I mean, cry really hard, right? Just you're ripped open completely and you're a, a mess on the floor. You're not able to suddenly function. You're dysfunctional in a way because you're broken open so much. So I can feel that new when you're speaking, that, 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 that grief. And that's a beautiful, it's not a negative emotion at all. It's a very beautiful yeah. emotion. So it has a, it's the most spiritual emotion to me. When I, have, when I feel my grief, I feel more ripped open to reality. I can feel the trees more. I can feel the sap going up and down them. I can feel the divine. I'm splayed open before the infinite. And it feels wonderful and horrible in some ways too, but it's, it's beautiful. Yeah. It's, it's an emotion to describe it would be called happy sad you know it's just one word there's such beauty here and there's such horror yeah and thank god we have the capacity to uh to be with it in a way that furthers us deepens us makes us more valuable to other people yeah when when uh, my brother he committed suicide in my house and we were very close you know how old, old, how old were you then uh, uh, late thirties wow. and, uh, he had, he'd been in a cult and he'd come out and he was really messed up and he'd been a very charismatic, just uh, amazing, talented, brilliant guy. And he, he got out of it for a while and did well, then he went back in. And then, uh, on, in the same, like in the same week, I had my dog get run over in front of my office where I was working. Mm-hmm. I found out that my partner was having an affair with a friend of mine. Wow. Uh, my brother committed suicide and I got fired from my job, you know? <laughs> and That's so awesome. I, I just like, wow. it, like all my, and I'd been to grad school and studied psychology and it, it felt like all my tools were like trying to empty the ocean with a teaspoon or something. You know, it was just like, there weren't enough. And uh, I just, I left, I got in my truck. I took care of the, my brother's body and that ceremony went to the thing. And then I just got in my truck and headed off, but I wandered around and apparently it was four years. People told me later I wasn't keeping track, but uh, about a year or so after that, I was staying with a friend in, in Northern Utah and I was, and all of a sudden it was just like, and I, I cried a little bit, you know, I'd had a few tears and stuff, but just started 
Mark, Mark. Yeah. And he came in and I just ripped open. Mm. I just shung, body chugging and, and just this volcanic thing of just grief just poured out of me. And uh, I, you know, I kept that all in for, you know, for a long time, for probably over a year before it finally hit. Yeah. And it was like, and that wasn't the end of it, but it certainly was, uh, thank God, it, it was a step in the right direction. It undammed it. Yeah. 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 Amen. Yeah. Then it can flow. You know, it's, it's, it's such a beautiful emotion in the sense you can be trusted. It has its own wisdom. And we may fight it. We want to control it. We want to have it go in a certain direction. And when we give ourselves to it fully, there's a liberation in that, an implicit liberation in saying yes to it. Yeah. Well, you sure got slammed during that period. That's, I guess I needed it. That's an uh, avalanche, right? <laughs> I know. It's like, really? You know, and, and up to then, my life had been pretty good. You know, my parents were alive. I loved them. Mm -hmm. My relationships, I was in a job. I was good and felt meaning, you know, and, and yeah. da, 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 bam, see ya. And uh, yeah. Isn't and, it yeah. wonderful we have, we have the capacity to work with this rather than just being taken down by it automatically? Amen. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, may this make us better men, you know, and I, I can really sense the, the, uh, the sweetness and the goodness and the humility or whatever that is, the grace that's coming out of you in your books and writings. And when, I, when I've spoken to you, it's... Yeah. Uh, and I think a lot, of them, a lot of men's work is to do with letting this crack open yeah. without losing our guts or our power or boundaries. But there's an alignment of head, heart, guts, balls, full-blooded alignment. And the heart is right at the core of it. I do men's groups. I see, the, I, I see as many tears in the men's groups as in the women's groups. Really wow. deep crying. Once the shame level, level has been worked with and cut through. And a lot of grief. So much grief. And beauty. Is there, is there a theme you see to the grief in, uh, in the men's groups? Yeah, a lot of it has to do with being out of been out of touch with who they are for so long, especially emotionally, mm. where they just have they allow themselves a little bit of anger in the form of aggression. Any shame that arises is quickly converted into aggression or emotional dissociation. There's a there's an emotional emptiness, and they can feel that when they get in touch with a boy part of them and they go regress somewhat. Well, now I can feel this is what my wife's talking about. Now I can cry hard. Now I can express my anger in a way that's passionate, fiery, but has some heart in it. That's a big thing. When a man can get angry and include his heart in his anger. Yeah. So if we're friends and I'm pissed at you, maybe I'm pissed at something, I'm quite intense. If I involve my heart, you're going to feel safer with me than if I don't. You won't feel like I'm attacking you. I'm just underlining something emphatically, but I'm still, I'm still with you. Mm -hmm. And then anger becomes a resource in relationship. It becomes a... a, a a sacred gift in some ways rather than being this problem of potential aggression yeah, yeah. yeah. and that's a distinctive feature you notice you, you said you worked with both men's and women's groups in yeah. some ways or had familiarity but i imagine that is much more distinctively male issue getting in touch with those those feelings. yeah and a lot of it has to do with with uh, sexuality too a lot of men have incredible shame around their porn habits Mm -hmm. and i teach them it's not to make it wrong i teach them how to outgrow it i show them the dysfunction of it and i'll say to a man tell me your favorite erotic fantasy one that gets you the most heated and turned on then i will take away the erotic elements and say what's left and what's left is almost always the early life conditioning that's not been faced and that ties mm -hmm. into my porn because it's such a pull but once the shame around that's cut through, then then the tears can come. Then they, they, they're, they're able to feel. Because in the women's groups, the main topics are often um, voice, getting their voice back, having anger, and learning that being direct does not mean you're not feminine. Some of them go, oh, I'm lost in my masculine because I'm being direct. Say, no, that's bullshit. That's some I don't tr trust that teaching at all. You're just being direct. And you're being forceful, and you have boundaries. You don't have to use you don't have to use your sexuality mm -hmm. to control a situation. You can have firm boundaries that you breathe energy into and you reinforce with your anger. 
Yeah. And this issue around pornography has become such a major issue for so many men, particularly, unfortunately, young males too, oh, because yeah. that's the first exposure they have to sexuality in many cases. And <clears throat> as a physician, it used to be someone came in with erectile dysfunction. The first thing you asked, okay, well, do you have hypertension? Do you have, have diabetes, et cetera? Mm. Now the first question <laughs> is, do you have much porn do you watch? Yeah. You know? And so we have a, you know, and, and this of course is the biggest, uh, biggest uh, commercial thing on the internet uh, mm -hmm. is pornography. Gee. And, and we're just probably at the tip of the iceberg because with virtual reality, we're going to see a whole nother level of inter internet addiction in general and pornography addiction in, in particular. Yeah, there's already VR uh, pornography, you know, um, I've mm -hmm. been told uh, we're interested in the technology to as a meditative tool, transformational tool. And I've talked to a lot of people in the last few years. And yeah, that's a big thing. You know, I don't have it. I'm not going to advertise. I don't know how to get there and I've never seen it, but you know, it follows that that would be part of it. And as, as the technology gets more, um, more powerful. Yeah. And, and I also say that probably a lot of uh, young women and girls get their first taste of sexuality, uh, by looking at pornography. I mean, their curiosity is there. It's, you know, and so what does that say to them? You know, the young girls that see this stuff, they may not be addicted to it uh, like men, some may be, and I don't know, but what does it tell them about what sexuality is, is about? Yeah. yeah. I have no idea. It's just a question I'm putting out. Yeah. I think it's an epidemic. And, and the first step though, I've taught so many men, the first step to working with, with for me is to, is to say to them, when you have the urge to use porn, masturbate to it, et cetera, stop, ask yourself, what am I feeling? Not lust, because lust is not so much a feeling, but what is going on emotionally? And they almost always will say loneliness, sadness, frustration, some sort of irritant in the nervous system. And masturbation was originally a tool that could relieve them of that very quickly when they're a young teen. And now it becomes a go-to mechanism. So when you do that, you tune into the loneliness, the hurt, the pain. I'll say, sit with that for four or five minutes, breathe with it. If you still want to masturbate mm -hmm. afterwards, go ahead, but do it without the imagery. And most men will find it shifts things very quickly for them because they reconnect with the younger them, the who they were before they first got into porn. They didn't have porn as an, a way, an outlet for their distress as a child or a young boy or a young teen. And there's a sense of um, agency in that that's very appealing to them. Suddenly, uh, here I am. I don't have to go along with this. I have a chapter in the To Be a Man book called Taking Charge of Your Charge, especially for men. We can't often help the charge we have in a split second with, say, a woman moving to a certain angle, a certain posture. But what we do in the succeeding se uh, seconds is very important. Do we feed that? Do we look through it? Do we illuminate? Do we self-reflect? Or do we just want to act it out and indulge it? And uh, Robert, I want to just generalize yeah. a point you're making here about, about um, when that urge to use pornography comes up, taking a moment to touch into the experience. And it's very reminiscent of the Alcoholics Anonymous uh, aphorism of, Using the, using the mnemonic HALT, check in for am I hungry, angry, mm. anxious, lonely, or tired? Yeah. And, you know, any of those things can be just be, be temporarily overwhelming or mm. uh, bring us into whatever our default way of, uh, of avoiding uh, our painful emotions is. Yeah, yeah. I also often ask men, what type of, what type of porn? Do you enjoy the most? I want to know the type, and then I, then I can tie that into their conditioning, what they're want, what they're trying to act out through it. But it all all based with some there's some healthy dose of self reflection there, and also to suggest if you start masturbating again, do it without imagery, just do it with the sensation, go slower, tune in, and see how see how see if the, how strong the pull is or not. Treat it as an experiment. And also to know if you're using porn and you would have a partner, there's a triangle. There's you, the partner, and the porn. And a man can be completely monogamous, seemingly faithful to his wife, and still have a pornographic mindset that he acts out in very subtle ways. 
Mm. So it's a big topic. Yeah. Yeah, and certainly one of one of the topics of our time. And I, I just want to point to a couple of the interventions you mentioned there, which are so universally therapeutic. One is just ch ch drop into experience, mm -hmm. literal experience of the moment, because usually we're a couple of at least a couple of mental layers divorced from our experience, mm -hmm. lost in in both imagery, association, fantasy, thoughts, yeah. beliefs, etc. And for so many psychological issues and dysfunctions and spiritual ones too, the answer is cut through the fantasy into the actual experience. And experience is innately therapeutic and healing. You know, when we actually get in touch with our experience, we find that it tends, it tends to be it tends to be healing because it undercuts the conditioning. It tends to be give us guidance as to what's appropriate in each and every moment because we, we that's just part of our the experience that's available to us in, in every moment, and it's self transcending because the actual experience uh, transcends so much of what uh, limits us in any moment. I want to bring in the the concept of intimacy here because if with intimacy you get very close to the subject, the person, the state of mind, this, this, this physical state you're in, but you don't fuse with it. There's a subtle distance. And that, that allows for more clarity. So my path, I would say, is being coming intimate with all that I am, cultivating intimacy with all that I am, all that is. And that creates that small but healthy distance from what I'm observing. So I can keep it in focus. I can read it more clearly. And that's something that came out of the five methoxy experiences. I, I be, started to feel far more intimate with life, my experience, everything. I got more, and I wasn't trying to be close. It just, I just felt closer and closer and closer and more curious, like a little kid turning over stones in the garden. I'm curious, what's underneath this rock right here? What, what? do I detect in myself here? Here's something I, that tends to, I tend to stay out of touch with myself, maybe my, maybe my capacity for violence. What's it look like? What's my history with it? How well do I know it? It's, it's becoming intimate with what's in my shadow, all the things I've tended to keep out of sight to varying degrees. Yeah, and I want to emphasize, just really reinforce the importance of what you're saying there, Robert, because curiosity is such a... I, I, it's such a healthy, beneficial attitude. And I'm trying to realizing, I, I was trying to think of any, in any of the classic contemplative traditions it's emphasized. I guess the closest I can think of is the Buddhist em mindfulness emphasis on investigation, on exploration. But the prior attitude to that is curiosity. And yes. curiosity is, is so beneficial in many ways. First, it takes us into the experience. And second is it's, it inhibits reactions like fear or avoidance, et cetera. Mm -hmm. and, and it just, and it brings us directly as we we're talking about before into our experience and therapeutic potentials of that direct experience has. Yeah. Yeah. I have a big yes for curiosity. I do, I do a prayer <laughs> before I start work. I just go, may I be compassionate, loving, <laughs> present, patient, curious, kind and mm. operating at an optimal skill level at every moment in this session and all upcoming work for the rest of my life. I do that. I like doing that. It settles me, but the curiosity is just as important as the other factors. Because mm. when I'm working with someone or a group, if I'm curious, I don't mm. get bored. I don't get restless. I don't uh, <laughs> impose my agendas on a direction someone's work is taking. I'm curious. Well, what if we try this? What if we try that? What if I just look in your left eye and compare it to your right eye? What happens? And I don't know, because implicit in that is a sense of not knowing and not, not yeah. in terms of everyday ignorance, but in, in a spiritual sense, intimacy with not knowing. And that's yeah. why I, my trained therapists, I teach them how to cultivate that when they're working with someone face to face, not to have a plan or an agenda, just see what happens and, and be intuitive, flow with it. And the curiosity. Yeah, when you, keeps it up. When so, you yeah. do that, it completely opens up in many, many cases, the person that you're talking to somebody is just reflecting right there 
and there's that energy they're really interested you know and and in some kind of compassionate way and if i have any <sighs> ability to the counselor or a therapist it's been my ability to listen well and i think it's helped in the podcast too career that uh it just that it's just so essential and it opens up people to their own selves in ways that perhaps mm -hmm. you know, Roger, I mean, Robert, you're, you're, can't hear you again. And I was thinking of dream work where I'm so damn curious. And I have to group off and say, what do you pick up on this person's dream? What's your intuitions? And I'll do my work with them. But I'm curious. It's like a portal is opened. And if I'm not curious, they'll feel me just being professional by not being more than professional. I'm not like right in there. I really want to know. I'm really curious. What, what color was that? When you flew, what's, what side were you leaning more toward or whatever it was? There's that. And I also like the, what goes along with the curiosity for me is not what I'm winging it here is innocence. Not naive innocence like a childhood, but an innocence that's more awakened, but still it's full of wonder. That's so when I plug in deeply to the divine, I feel that. I'm curious. I'm innocent. It's an innocence. I'm not jaded by my experience. That's another thing in the five methoxy, but jam me, jolt me out of my all, sense of having already arrived. And there I am, a, a child again. Hurting, crazy, but still there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So much, so much power in that combination of um, curiosity and the the recognition of bottomless mystery somehow that mm, you know, there's always more there's always another level there's I always you might have to say that roger i mean <laughs> I, I, I share that light because this i mean intimacy with the mystery my wife has a, as a singer one of her chants is i open to the mystery repeat mm. you know? and i feel like i open to the mystery and the closer i get to it guess what it's even more mysterious yeah instead yeah. of trying to figure the damn thing out i'm here to affirm it <laughs> and, and since we, we're here to embody it i mean when i think of my own dying and death i imagine just opening to the mystery a hundred percent letting go of all my ideas knowledge I, things i might suspect could happen when i'm dying or at death here's the mystery and we get we get to become intimate with as we need want to and there's no end to it like you said it's bottomless edgeless and wow and the part of the mystery that wants to figure it out is still part of the mystery it's still <laughs> there uh, yeah. yeah yeah beautifully beautifully said yes and you remind me of, of ramdas who of course spent so much of his life working with the dying and and exploring it and uh he had a beautiful line said death is the ultimate mystery uh -huh. and, yeah, it sounds like he you used to say when he woke up in the morning, he was going to be with someone who's dying. He says, he, I couldn't wait to get in there. <laughs> I get to be with someone who's dying today. It turned him on in a good way. To, I, I get to be in the presence of, of deep truth, mystery, mm. beauty. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, Robert, I want, to, I want to go back to the general topic of your book, To Be a Man, because this there's so many there are of course the perennial issues why we can understand about the issues of you know being uh, living fully and well as a man and you certainly mentioned those the emotional intimacy the challenges with challenges with emotions but we've also talked about pornography which is and 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 the internet which those addictions are of course new to us there are there are new full, new kinds of drugs. So there are um, technology is presenting us with uh, incredible opportunities and gifts. And I think all yeah. of us are alive. All three of us are alive because of medical, modern medical technology. And at the same time, it's presenting so many new challenges, both mm -hmm. direct challenges such as the internet and pornography and yeah. for, forthcoming virtual reality, but also the cultural aftershocks, et cetera, and the way that, way that so much is changing in our ways of living and our ways of relating. 
what do you see as some of the unique challenges for men of our time? And what do you see as some of the emerging challenges? Well, the book title, Sirs, initiated that for me by saying to be a man. It took a while for me and Sounds True to come up with the title, but it was to be a man. So it made me care, what, what, is, what is a healthy male? What qualities are there? And I, I, I talked about shame, how to work with shame, I just not throwing shame in the trash bin like some people do. They say shame's bad. I think shame has unhealthy dimension and a healthy dimension. Yeah. Anger has the same. Anger can become aggression, which is unhealthy, or it can be heart centered and it still, it still has its passion. It's still there. Yeah, and and Robert, uh, it seems that you are a part of the men's movement, right? I mean, just the work you do sounds like you were associated with that when that first started coming into, into uh, consciousness or happening, I think it was probably the mid eighties, late eighties when it happened. And I was, I was in grad school. I was in the Bay area at that time. And there were all these men's groups starting up and I was, you know, being the arrogant dummy that I can be sometimes I was like, I was really close to my dad. You know, I loved him very much. He was still alive then. And we'd hug and kiss each other and sit on the, you know, watch television, arms around each other. You know, I, I said, I got that. I don't need the father. And I'd been in the army and I, you know, I felt what it like, you know, to, to, mm. to bond with men and really love them as brothers. And yeah. so I, I um, so I kind of blew it off and I mm. thought I didn't need that. I'd had my, you know, my masculine thing. Um, Build. And since I've been a little more beat up and broken, yeah. I, I think I've definitely changed my tune somewhat. And we're, we're in very interesting times. And a lot of on the, the far uh, left end of the spectrum, where you have wokeism and uh, yeah. Yeah. Every, everybody's a victim except a white straight man. You know, and and I've always been very progressive. I was the youngest of, of three brothers. So I was the disenfranchised or the weak ones or I, I just peel to me. So from very, yeah. when I was yeah. four years old, I was listening to the adults talk about the civil rights movement. We were in Mexico, but they're, you know, they were very, you shouldn't have to let that guy in your restaurant if you don't want to. And all these kind of things that were people were struggling with. And I was like, no, you guys are wrong. Those guys are right. You know? So you always, you, you, you know, if there, you grow up with racism, you become a racist. Well, I didn't for whatever reason. And, uh, I went, you know, with black people and Hispanics. Of course, I grew up in Latin America and gays uh, yeah. and just all of these these groups. But now in, in the last couple of years, I've been wanting to be protective of white men, straight white men, because some of my best friends are straight white men, you mm -hmm. know, and, and I, I think it's just a bum rap. And you have some little kid, you know, has an alcoholic dad and a borderline mother. And you tell him, well, you're this privileged group and you're, you know, you, all the all the awfulness of the world is on your shoulders. That's certainly not fair. And one of my big all time heroes, of course, is Dr. Martin Luther King. And that that, that maybe I'm paraphrasing this, but he says I hope there comes a time when my grandchildren will be judged by the content of their character and not the color of their skin or their plumbing or their gender, but yeah. by the content <laughs> of their character and their minds. Yes. And I feel like it's time that we, all right, yes, if you go back far enough in all of our histories, our ancestors did awful things, okay, I'm sure. And and uh, I heard a, a black man recently on, in, on YouTube, and he said, man, I don't want to be blamed for what my granddad did, but we seem to be wanting to put, you know, and, and in a certain way, yes, we have to take responsibility for that. And yeah. in another yeah. way, we don't. So just... Yeah, how uh, do you feel about that? And well, the stakes are high. And to go back to Roger's question about what what um, challenges are for, there for men now. One of them is like is, is reclaiming our integrity of being, getting in touch, getting lined up. So we're not we're not back and forth behind our forehead around different things. We're not playing Democrat versus Republican. We're going deeper. We're lining up. We're getting lined up. So we're not going left brain, right brain. We're going whole brain. And it's, and it's connected to our body. We're more embodied. And we learn how to be in relationship. One of the main things I have in my men's groups is the men don't, a lot of them don't know how to be with women in a way that's really clean without cutting off their balls. I'll say, well, how can you keep your balls and reclaim your integrity? What do you do? You, you listen more, you have more, but you also can challenge. 
you also don't get stuck in guilt spirals because you're white. It doesn't, that doesn't work. If you, if you and I are friends and you've hurt me in some way and you're apologizing profusely and groveling before me, that's not what I need. I want you to be in relationship with me, not groveling and self-flagellating. And a lot of, I see a lot of people flagellating themselves as a way of virtue signaling. They're doing, they're overdoing that. Yeah. I have people in my trainings, I have social justice warriors in there. They have shadow too. So I'm working with their shadow, which is often not to acknowledge they have shadow, et cetera. So there, it's, but I think men have a huge challenge. I think a lot more men are showing up for work now to get lined up, not just to become softer men, more heart, but also to become more powerful where their anger is real. It's strong. They have balls and they're safe. When women are around them in groups, I do that are mixed groups. The women feel safe with men who are like that. Not the quiet ones are always nice and sweet, but the ones who can get angry, they're forceful, but they're vulnerable. That's a huge thing for most men is to get more vulnerable. Women have it down a little more than us in general. There's exceptions, of course, but to be more vulnerable. I'm with my wife. I'm not vulnerable. And she, she can read me so closely. Oh, split second. <laughs> there you are. What are you really feeling, Robert? What's going on? You said that. And I like being busted. I've learned to like being busted by her and vice versa. We're really good for each other that way. Mutual transparency. But being vulnerable. Another gift from the five pathoxy. I was not very vulnerable before. I could be selectively vulnerable in certain situations. But afterwards, I felt more open consistently and i still have boundaries if someone treats me badly i don't just take it and assume that it's sure. a great teaching i will sometimes push back no it's not for me stop don't so men have this huge invitation but women too there's a lot of women tend to they they got as much work to do in my view as, as men it's in a different category it's all about waking up and an embodied awakening that includes shadow work includes intimacy with all that we are and the stakes are very, very high. I mean, we're at one hell of an edge as a species when I look around. One hell of an edge. And it's, it's almost scary how easily it gets normalized. Yeah, but we, we, we still have to honor the strong masculine. You know, the, the, the person that's willing to give up his life for his family, for his children, <clears throat> people, whether it's going, you know, waking up and going to work every day or it's, you know, uh, in, in a military or as a policeman or something. What was your parallel with women? What would be the strong feminine for you? Um, would be a woman that has developed a lot of her masculine side, okay? And at the same time can be absolutely very feminine at the same time. So it's, it's like Jung said, you know, there's this, the, the, when, we, when we finally get it together, we balance the masculine with the feminine. And I would say it's yeah. the exact same thing for the men. So you're it, talking about being, being whole, being yeah. truly whole. Sure. Where all these different polarities work, they work together, not in opposition. Yeah. And that's a big thing that you can't just decide one day to do that. That's a, that's a lot of work. It's also easy to be seduced by plateaus along the way where we think <clears throat> we think we've arrived like I did way back when. We haven't really arrived. We're just, we found a kind of com comfortable zone to hang out in, but we haven't arrived. There's more to go. And for me, it's, when I was younger, I thought, well, there has to be an end to this. It's the spiritual rungs is a realization of beyond realization, blah, blah, blah. That dropped me for a long time ago. And I feel like now I'm on a journey of endless discovery. And I'm not in a hurry to get to the end because I don't sense an end. I just sent there's an infinite number of possibilities before me. There's ev evolution has no real end to it to me. And I don't mind that. I like it. It's the mystery. Mystery mm. abides. Yeah. And that uh, feels like a really important uh, juncture on the spiritual path of, of aiming for a specific state or experience or realization mm. with the assumption that that'll handle it all to the recognition that first, nothing handles it all. And second, that, as you said, it's endless mystery. And yeah. the beauty of that is not just endless mystery, but endless possibility of opening and, yeah. and transformation. Yeah. And we had the privilege of having a, a guest on uh, in our uh, recent dialogue, who, Hamid Ali, the founder of the yeah. Diamond work and uh, Ridwan School. And I have to say he articulated more, better than anyone I've ever heard that 
crucial distinction between the perspective that most spiritual paths have, mm -hmm. that there is one particular state, realization, discovery, opening, mm -hmm. that is the goal and the end. And basically, once you get there, the goal is to hang out and to stabilize it. Yeah. And his perspective, which is, uh, well, yes, there is that experience, that state, but there's also this one and that one, and this tradition points to a particular mm -hmm. realization. Mm -hmm. And... Beyond even that, there's a possibility of each realization being a portal into further realizations. I agree. Uh, yeah. And it gives a very different view of freedom because in the traditional uh, perspective of most paths, freedom lies in realizing and then stabilizing a particular state mm -hmm. or realization. And in much more rarely one sees, and I think Hamid articulated it better than anyone I've ever run across, there's another kind of more encompassing and presumably more profound freedom, which is the capacity to be with any experience and, yes. to, and to recognize any experience as a full expression of reality, of the absolute, of, of truth, etc. Yeah. And implicit in that is not privileging a non-dual over the dual. Yes. There's a problem I have with non duality. I've been working with different teachers and that thing. I'll say, I, what I sense here, the differences are being homogenized. It doesn't feel right to me. There's, there's not an honoring <clears throat> of individual differences and the profound impact we have as unique individuals. Mm -hmm. There's that. And, and um, I like what Hamid's saying. I mean, he had, what my favorite book is, is called Runaway Realization. Oh, mine too. Yes. <laughs> so, well, thanks for cutting loose. Like, this is it. People may not get it, but you're, you're cutting loose now. You're not trying to just be a diamond heart teacher. You're going beyond that. Yeah. Yeah. And we actually uh, asked if we could focus on that in his subsequent book, uh, The Alchemy of Freedom, in our, in our dialogue. I think you'll enjoy it. <laughs> and also, I think the, the deepest freedom doesn't require you have a choice. I think the deepest freedom means you, you don't no longer have to have a choice. Like, I don't feel like I have a choice to write or to work with people the way I do. It's just, a, it's in my blood. It's a given. Yeah. I don't do it to make money. I do it because I, I love it. And I've been loving it ever since I started writing and working with people. And, and we probably need to be uh, careful and, and discerning here because not having a choice feels like a lot could, could be interpreted as a la lack of freedom or a loss of freedom. Exactly. And I think what you're pointing to is more the recognition. This is my unique way of being. This is my calling. This is my Dharma. And there is, delight in simply flowing with it does that yeah. feel right yeah it does and also it's like there's a consideration what is choice exactly to as a philosophical what is choice what's the anatomy of choice who's doing the choosing my conditioning me and then we end up in mystery again <laughs> Funny how we uh, keep ending up there, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's <is> everywhere. <laughs> uh, well, Robert, I want to go back to back to a previous question I raised, and that is we is that we talked a little about what are some of the unique challenges of our time that men face, and if there's more you have to say about that, I'd love to hear it. But also, what are some of the emerging challenges that you see? <clears throat> I think a lot of it is to do with uh, integrity. Mm -hmm. to, have, to, have, to have more integrity and to discover to learn what that is and to be lined up internally so that you are not seducible by the usual pulls you're not seducible sexually you're not seducible intellectually you're also not rigidly trying to be yourself but you're, you're there's a there's a sense of alignment internally so you're not going to be you cannot be swayed unless it's for a really good reason and you flow with that and that's, that's growing up. That's becoming more mature. I mean, I do the men's group. Sometimes I love it when I have guys in their 70s in the group and I have guys in their 20s. As I love seeing the, 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 the two age groups see each other, see each other do their work and celebrate that. And that since the evolution is possible, I think it's also to do with the relationship. I mean, I think a lot of men have, have not entered relationship deeply superficial is too sexually oriented they haven't gone really deep with a partner and i think my my i think the deepest growth i've ever had is from being with my wife it's the easiest relationship right from the beginning and yet it's been the most challenging because there's so such transparency and vulnerability 
So I, I've grown more from being with her than from anything else, including my five methoxy. It's just like, this is it. So I often promote intimate relationship as a path of awakening for those that are willing to do the work. It's a lot. And, 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 and not so emphasized traditionally in, in traditional contemplative practice, the relationship was primarily centered either oriented towards God or guru. Yeah. And, and there really wasn't so much on peer relationship as a path. No. And yet that's one of the things you've been laying out and emphasizing just how profoundly valuable it can be. And I, <laughs> I think it was the advanced yoga after you've spent a year or so in retreat <laughs> or done, <laughs> done a few years of practice and therapy, yeah. then, <laughs> then you know, maybe it can handle a really intimate relationship. I well, exaggerate. I've, I've, of called, I've called intimate relationship the ashram of the 21st century. It, right. it can be. Many people glorify that and they, they, they don't do the work that's required. They don't outgrow their reactivity, et cetera. But it's sitting there and I, I'm, I'm living in it and I love it. Even though it's going to be very painful if she dies before me, it's like, yeah. so what? That's, that's what happens. I, I welcome the devastation in an odd sense. Yeah, you're Roger and, and I don't know, people know, but you lost your, your life partner uh, of many years and a highly respected uh, a woman just a few years ago and that's kind of when we met and and I know I mean she's not around physically anymore as she mm -hmm. was but how does that continue on with the grief the loss the change but those years together how does that that continue mm -hmm. to resonate in your life mm -hmm. well that's a large large question wow. and and of course uh, it was such a powerful and gifted relationship that uh, she really was a very, very remarkable and wise woman that it was, as Robert was saying, a, uh, <laughs> yeah, a very, a very uh, powerful practice, in fact, mm -hmm. as powerful as any I've done. And, and of course, uh, I think she, her teachings and inspiration and feedback, etc., live on in, in my life. Mm -hmm. And I think forever I will be touched mm. by her and uh, and partly a, uh, gifted by and a product of her and her, her, her many yeah. extraordinary qualities. So. Do you still talk to her? I don't. Um, no, that's, uh, people have asked that, but I, I don't really. Sometimes I ask, you know, kind of in a guidance, but I don't mm. have a sense of communication with her. Do you feel a communion with her? Oh, I'd, I'd have to explore what you mean by communion. Yeah. Connection? Non-physical uh, connection? Not so much. Uh, a number of people seem to expect that I would, given how remarkable the relationship was, but mm. it's, uh, I, I can't say I, I do. It's like, yeah, she's gone. So yeah. yeah. Do you miss her? Um, let's see. Well, of course, there was enormous grief when she died. She died very suddenly. We went out yeah. to dinner with some friends, and five minutes after we got there, she complained of chest pain, and five hours later, she was dead. So, wow. so there was a great grief, and that, of course, as you described, was an enormous learning. Because, yeah. and I'm so grateful for spiritual practice and spiritual tools. You know, it's like. Mm made an enormous difference. And I know I got away much lighter than most people do with grief. Just by, yeah. you know, well, yeah. there's one person who came to see me 24, 24 hours after she died said, you don't seem surprised. I said, I'm not surprised. I knew this would happen or I'd go first, but I'm shocked. Mm. Um, so, so in many ways, I was fortunate in having a lot of tools to work with and having having some as much as one can prepared for this. So. Yeah. Well, my wife and I, we talk about this quite often because, you know, she's got breast cancer now. I've, mm. I've had prostate cancer since 2008, had the heart attack. So we're he we look healthy, we feel healthy, but we're vulnerable. So we talk about this, what it would be like for the one that's left. What do we want to do at, you know, when the person dies? And we look at it, we feel it. Sometimes it's very sad. Other times it's where it's very expansive. Suddenly we, we go into that zone where suddenly it's just mystery, looking at it, mystery, looking at itself, 
no escape from feeling in that, but just simply depth, more depth. And no matter what happens, I know I'd be profoundly grateful. I'll be devastated in a way, but I'll be very grateful to have had that time with her. Yes. Have a true partnership. And she worked with me side by side for many years. And then six years ago, she had to retire from it. It was just too much for her being around all that emotional pain, trauma. She needed to take a break. And she's returning to her other love, which is music as a singer, a songwriter. And I continue on because it's I, I love doing this. I'll probably do it till I'm really, really old. I have a friend in Canada who's 86 who's still doing this full time. And I may be following down the same path. I don't know. Are you still are you still working with people? Uh well, yes, but uh but more in more in a spiritual context than psychotherapeutic at this at this stage. Uh so yes, I privilege i you know re retirement has no <laughs> appeal whatsoever <laughs> yeah i mean we we're, were so privileged to be able to do meaningful work and can make contributions so so yeah it's a gift yeah um, very rich very rich i want to touch back into something you just touched on and that was pointing to the precipice we are on as a species and mm -hmm. and just ask it's a kind of open-ended question about if, if there is something you'd like to say about that uh, open into i think the first thing is i'd wish more people were aware we're at that edge you don't need to have climate you know there's things have to have to get a lot worse like most people are doing really deep work i find if they're suffering enough they'll go they'll go to the edge if they're not suffering that much they have a harder time going to the edge I think as a species, where there's a lot of denial. I, when I go to the gym now, I'm just thinking of this. I'm in there working out. I like doing weightlifting stuff. But I do, I'm aware, I'm breathing, I'm doing it. But most people around me are like this. They're on their phone almost the whole time. And sometimes I have to ask them, excuse me, can I step in here? I want to use this machine. And they have to get off their phone. They're texting, they're scrolling. I know that one well, yeah. And that and that, that, that does irritate me. I'm like, can't you? There's so much going on right now. I understand the human need to numb ourselves to, to crises, potential crises, but if there was a time for waking up, this is it. And do you see this, when you work very deeply, particularly with men, but also with women, do you, do you see this, how do you see uh, this, this existential crisis we're facing? Uh, confronting men and, and women, men today? I think it's going to probably get worse before it gets better. And I also mm -hmm. think in groups, I'm doing my trainings with men and women. I bring this up fairly often and we don't try and figure it out. It's more like just feel it, feel what's going on. Think, don't numb yourself. I had a guy from the Ukraine in a group recently and he cried his guts out over what was yeah. going on when he was given a chance, shifted the whole, the whole group. It was so important. But the more that's needed, where we grieve together, we feel it like here's the edge. I mean, I live in a very privileged part of the country. I mean, it's very peaceful here. There's no, no fires, no hurricanes. It's very peaceful. But I know not far away from here, there's a lot of trouble. And I think all we can do is use that as a, as a catalyst <clears throat> for deepening our, our awakening. Become aware, more aware of shadow because an unresolved, unresolved shadow elements run us until we are aware of them. They just run us. And I see the planet being run by a lot of leaders. Shadow is running the, running the program without any awareness. And how do, you, how do you inspire people on that scale to do that? I gave up on that. I'm not meant to go on giant stages and do that. I do it with small groups at a time. I'm having an impact, but it's, I only can take a certain number of people at a time and do the appropriately deep work with them in that. So on one hand, it's kind of hopeless. The other hand, I have I have a abiding faith in, in life continuing. I know that I am life outlives me, but I also am life. That that helps me. Mm -hmm. And we're all we're at this edge. And I really feel grief for the upcoming generations, our grandchildren. Like, wow, what are they what are they going to be living in? Probably something not as privileged and pleasant as this well, who, although who knows i don't know for sure of course and do you see this in, an awareness of the 
existential crisis and the emotional impact of that coming up in as you invite men to do yes. deep work? I see more and more people having it in their dreams. Mm -hmm. And I, one thing I teach people is how to work with nightmares. Like instead of trying to leave the nightmare, many, many people want them. When they realize it's a nightmare. They want to get the hell out of there. I'll say, what? Learn to practice staying in the nightmare. You're conscious in the nightmare. If you want, you can change your body. Lucid dreaming, you can fly. You could do something, but stay, stay there. You're so close to the, having a clear view of your own trauma and collective trauma. So it's a bit like my work is to help people get closer to what they'd rather not be close to. Mm -hmm. Here's the edge. Here's the pain. It's not very popular, but I'm, I want you to move towards this. I'll show you how step by step, not too fast, not too slow. I know without turn, facing our pain, we're, we're, we're just absolutely seducible by all the distractions from it. Mm -hmm. And that's, 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 you know, electronic addiction, biochemical addiction there's so much of it around so much suffering and and so much of healing work and uh growth work both psychological and spiritual comes from uh that willingness to open to those experiences we've previously avoided exactly. in fact one can say that that is perhaps the core of psychotherapy that's that's it in a, in a nutshell, isn't it? Yeah, turning yeah. toward what we normally would turn away from. Yeah. And, and I had, yeah. a, I had a, when you were telling your story about you know where you were and then having this DMT like catastrophe uh, and how that came out. Um, I was thinking that or feeling that that's uh, in a personal way probably what's going to happen to us as a species. You know, things are going to get so bad and just so awful and so catastrophic that it looks like the end has come. But yet out of that, we'll, we'll become a species that and it largely has been reborn in, in good ways. Maybe yeah. not as arrogant and, you know, technologically sophisticated, but something will shift. And we talked to um, Chris Bache, Dr. Christopher Bache here, and he had written a book called uh, LSD in the Mind of the Universe. And over a 10 year period, he did 73 very high high dose controlled LSD experiences. And he was just given an amazing amount of teaching. And finally he said, by the way, stop for you. You need to write this. And it took him another 10 years to write it. And uh, I don't know anybody could handle it as well as he did. He's a very humble and learned man. And he was able to come back. But one of the things he said, yeah, that, that what seemed to be coming through is that things were going to get a lot worse but ultimately it was going to be very good. And uh, well, implicit in that is the fact that people often, the worst circumstances often bring out the best, in at least some people. Not mm -hmm. everyone, but a lot of people, it brings out the best, like war, heavy wartime. I thought the fly was on my screen, but it's on your face. Oh, constantly. And he really likes me a lot. He likes you a lot. He, has, he wants to say something too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And, and one of the challenges of our time, Robert, is clearly going to be, as the challenges mount, finding and, in, and making available to people those perspectives and practices which help transform challenges into opportunities. Mm -hmm. Because you're right, under stress, most people automatically regress. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the default reaction you know, we become more egocentric more tunnel vision short-term yeah. thinking about me etc survival and yet as you point out there's clearly the possibility given the right conditions for people to step forward and expand to meet the challenge and to lead mm -hmm. others in doing so you know i see yeah. it i was just thinking of my shorter groups i do three-day groups for men and women there are only six people allowed in they always form a community, even though I no longer am interested in community, given my early experiences, I'm just not drawn to doing that anymore. They all, six strangers always form a community over in the first day. And after the end of three days, they're, they're close friends. They want to stay in touch. There's that human sense of community when there's, when there's permission to be yourself and to show the, or, or your full self. And a lot of them will say they don't have that outside of the group like that. They don't have that in their life with their husband, their wife, their kids. But they sense, ah, oh, here's what it is to be plugged in and 
doing it through a group consciousness as well as, as an individuated consciousness. But I used to try and do this on a big scale. It didn't work. I found my groups have gotten smaller and smaller. So everyone gets full attention. No one gets left out. And isn't it a tragedy that so many people will say after coming into therapy or a, or a deep group experience such as you're describing, this is the most intimate r relationship I've had. Yeah, and they're very sad at the end because I think, what am I going to do now? Say, well, you stay in touch with the others and try and bring this into your life more. So all I can do is plant the seed. Some people take it. Other people go back to the old habits. And I, I've mm -hmm. learned to let go of my attachment that they will hang in there and turn the corner. Even though I will say when I see someone staying with the work long enough, they will turn the corner and not be able to go back. They're no longer a caterpillar. They got their wings now, but they have to hang in there. Yeah. That, takes, that takes an existential courage. Yes, and I've never been able to figure out why it is that certain people take various growth steps. For example, why, why some people even begin to develop an interest in psychological and spiritual growth. Why some people go into therapy or take up a practice and why people's, some people uh, persist with it while others don't and why, why others really dive deep. It's, a, it's mm -hmm. been a mystery to me. It is a mystery. We can attribute it. We can talk about past lives, karma, but that, that's just, that doesn't really help very much. It's more, mm -hmm. some people are more ready. Like if I, have, I have four siblings. I'm the only one who's taken this jump. I took it when I was young, in my 20s. The others haven't taken the jump. They're not interested. They think I'm crazy or not interested. You know, Hamid was talking about that in his book and in our conversation about that activation, you know, when some, you know, the, the cocoon starts to open up and that almost everybody on the path at some point has this, sometimes when they're very young, in my case, I was thinking it was 11 when I had my first big experience of God. And when was that for you, Robert? Can you, can you point your finger to, I had, it was a very, very, I had it as a very young child. I was wide, wide open, but I was in an abusive household. So I, I learned to adapt to that by the time I was three or four. And my adolescence was a desert. Nothing happened. And then I was 21. I was doing a PhD in biochemistry. And someone said, you want to try some mescaline? I said, okay. I had mescaline. I sat for hours looking at the flowers. And I felt my whole being expand. I felt plugged into who I was as a little boy. That was my first real awakening. And I had a lot of awakenings during lucid dreaming. And I had awakenings. I went to the Rajneesh Ashram when it was a long, long time ago. I had a huge awakening there, even though I did not like being there very much. But I had those moments of just, ah, oh, here's who I am. Here's this. But I was driven. When I first had my first therapeutic experience, I said, I want to do more of this. I'm interested. I want to know more about body work, psychotherapy, how to incorporate spirituality into psychotherapy. I was so curious. And many people I knew around me didn't have the curiosity. And even being around me, some of them picked up, got a contact high from me. They try it for a little bit, but it wasn't in their bones to do it. Whereas I would do it no matter where I was. My problem was when I was younger, I assumed I'd arrive well before I had. I thought I was at the top of the mountain. I was actually just the, just the base camp at the bottom. <laughs> I thought I was the peak. Is, are <laughs> any of us beyond base camp? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Earth to Robert, come on, wake up here. Yeah. Uh, Robert, this has been, this has been um, such a delightful, delightful conversation. And I, mm. like John, I just appreciate your openness and vulnerability and, mm. and authenticity. It's very beautiful. Yeah. Um, is there anything you'd like to say or discuss before we have, kind of move towards closure? John has something. I, I have one John more question that. before we get to that point. And I would be remiss not to ask this question. And Heidi always reminds me to do this. Oh, yeah. And practice, transformational practice has been a huge part of my life and work for a long time now. So I would ask you at this point in your life, what is your practice? What does that look like? Being as intimate as possible with all that I am. All that I am. All that I am. And I have, I, I don't meditate formally anymore. Mm -hmm. I do short prayers before I work. Um, I actually, I work out a lot, just paying attention and being, staying completely transparent, open to my wife or around each other a lot. That's my practice. Now and then I like to sit for a long time or two. But I like 
I don't need the, like the, my younger man. I don't do retreats anymore. And I, and the other practice is, is attuning to my mortality and implicit in which is a statement. It just comes to me now releasing all that I took and take to be mine. That's a gradual process. Like I'm no longer concerned about plagiarism. Other authors want to quote me. They don't, they may, I say, you don't have to even quote me. Just use whatever you want. Take it. I mean, it came through me. It's my book. My name's on it, but I, I don't feel the same degree of mine, me. It's fading naturally as I get older. I turn 75 in a few months. So, And I have to say, I, my favorite decade is my 70s by far. Beautiful. And as someone who uh, still is deeply drawn to meditation, I hesitate to use the word addicted, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but attached, certainly. It's a more socially acceptable term. <laughs> there are worse addictions. Uh, I'd be intrigued to hear what, uh, what the shift has been for you that that no longer draws you. Well, I did a lot of it when I was in the 70s, early 80s. I did Vipassana courses. Which did Rajneesh stuff, did all that. And I felt the need of it slip as I became more meditative naturally during the day. Mm -hmm. Not like I'm constantly in it, but I'm, I'm every, every hour, half hour, 15 minutes, I'm plugging in. I wear my breathing, but I'm not doing like a chunk of day, then the rest of the day is different. It's like it's, it's consistent. And when I feel need to go really deep, I'll just lay very still, drop in. Well, the other practice I have once here, this is a little not quite as serious. I get out of bed and I do a plank. <laughs> you ever done a plank? Mm -hmm. I hate, I hate them. I used to, I just want to quit as soon as I've done 15 seconds. I'm, I'm working that's, my that's way a long time. Up. It's not easy. I'm working my way up to five minutes. I'm over four minutes now and I'm shaking like a leaf doing it. <laughs> but it's a discipline, it's an odd thing and it's quick. Hmm. Yeah. Just being present. Just being present feels really good. Being present. Yep. Well, be here now is wrong to us. <laughs> <laughs> and I really enjoyed this too, because you're, you're both so present. So, I mean, it was a, it wasn't an interview. It was lovely to have the conversation. Uh, well, it's a, yes. It's a beautiful conversation indeed. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's, that's what we hope for. And that's what is, is a delight to meet mm. and to dialogue and co-explore together. Mm. As, Have you known uh, John for very long? Well, let's see, about uh, six years, I think. Something uh, like that, yeah. yeah. And yeah. It was amazing for me to become a friend with Roger because I really admired him and his work and his books and stuff. And then we became friends. And this is this deep transformation, this thing that we do has been such an incredible blessing for me. It's really helped me. And to be able to experience it with Roger, man, I, I've always respected since I've heard of him, but I've grown to really love and to participate in these experiences. Yeah. And it's been, it just means very much to me. Well, and, you're a great, you're a great team. Yeah. I felt extremely at ease, comfortable the whole time, even though we started off with the topic that's a little tricky for me, but let's just dive in. Yeah. You handled it wonderfully. Oh yeah. my God, you were just so clear and went right there. And I was just like, I didn't know if you're going to say turn the machine off or whatever, but you you were so gracious and so so open. It's mm -hmm. it's a tremendous, tremendous blessing. And I hope more people read that part of your life because a lot of people need to read it and hear that. Yeah. 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 Particularly at this at this time when when the DMT psychedelics are becoming coming very fashionable yeah. very fashionable yes for better and for worse uh robert anything you'd like to add before we come to no. a close I no feel <laughs> i feel done in a good way i'm, I'm <laughs> well cooked <laughs> well cooked well yeah. well for my part thank you so much for being with us thank you for your life's work thank you for being going through the fire and being willing to really uh really just open to the fullness of your humanity and your experience in the way you have. It's an inspiration. I've, I feel touched by you and what you do, what you've done and are doing. So thank you. Thank you. And it makes me look forward to my seventies. How old are you, John? I'm 65. Okay. Getting closer. I think I'm 66, actually. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I just have a birthday. 
Uh, well, thank you very much. Okay, both guys. Of you. Okay. Awesome. Thank you.